Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. I, was, I guess I was expecting one more. I'm so happy to see you all here today. A special word of welcome to those of you that are visiting with us today. We are particularly grateful for your presence here and hope that you find this time of worship together to be meaningful. Same goes for you that are joining us via live stream. We are grateful that you are worshiping with us and uh, to visitors that have found us that way. We are so happy to have you with us today as well. We did have two funerals yesterday and had some technical difficulties. They were uh, able to be live streamed through Facebook, uh, but not from our website. So if you uh, tried to log in uh, and were unable to, we apologize for that. We, that issue has been fixed and hopefully today's worship is coming through fine. Uh, but those services will be available, if not now, uh, tomorrow, uh, where you should be able to watch the recording of those services uh, if you were not able to join us yesterday yesterday. So we apologize for that snafu. We are kind of getting our technical feet under us in real time. It's uh, fun and frustrating. We'd like to remind you that next Saturday is Reserve the Third. I will be helping at Urban Mission, so please contact Roan Pittman if you would like to join in to that. Uh, and also for our children next Sunday, we have the three King's Day craft event that will be via Zoom next Sunday at four o'clock. Supplies for that uh, are in your Sunday school bag for January, so we hope you'll join us uh, for that. Uh, today is an exciting and special day in the life of our church as we ordain and install a new class of elders and deacons, uh, so we look forward to that celebration a little bit later in our service. But now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please rise now in spirit or in body and join me in the call to worship found printed in your bulletin. The grace of God has dawned upon the world with healing for all humankind. Nation shall come to your light. Let us worship God.
Please join me in the prayer of the day. Everlasting God, the radiance of faithful souls who brought the nations to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising, fill the world with your glory and show yourself to all of the nations through him who is the true light and the bright morning star, Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The psalmist models a transparent faith with these words. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. We express our longing for Lord's leading by our own transparent confessions. Let us pray together. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, cleanse us of our sin and baptize us once again with your spirit that, forgiven and renewed, we may show forth your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we are all called as members of a single body. Please greet and respond to one another. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. I could have the young disciples come forward and do not sit on the carpet squares. We're going to save those for other people for later in the service. But if you could just kind of spread yourself out, just kind of along the back side of the first pew. Perfect. Excellent job. We are really good at this. So something very exciting happened earlier on this week. Who can tell me what it was? has to do with the date changing. Yes. What was it? Do you know? How about New Year's? It's a new year, everyone. I know it doesn't feel that way because school is still in the same year that you were before, but it's a new year for all the rest of us. And one of the things you do during New Year's time, or a lot of people like to do, is they like to make resolutions. And usually these things are, you know, eat better, work out more, sleep more, things to make us feel healthier most of the time, right? But there was once a man who came up with this list, and I don't know who this man is, it just says a man, who came up with this list of kind of unorthodox sounding New Year's resolutions, things you wouldn't normally hear in church. But I'm gonna read this list to you and bear with me, it might make sense by the end. So they say, in the new year, be sure to lie, cheat, drink, swear, and steal, and you'll have a better year. And he explains, lie back and relax just a little more this year. Let a little more life happen to you without so much worry. 
cheat failure. Don't be afraid to try something new because you think you might fail. It is through failure that we learn the most valuable lessons. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. Many people around you have already been down roads you are about to travel. Learn from the mistakes that they have made and take what, th and take what they have learned and use it. Swear to do your best all the time in every situation. That is all anybody can ever ask. And steal a little time for God. Every day take a little more time to develop your relationship with God. So you just have to learn to lie, cheat, drink, swear, and steal a little more this year, and you're going to have a better year. Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, thank you for New Year's and clean slates. Help us to live this year in a way that will be pleasing to you. Will you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not its temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6. For those of you in, in the sanctuary today, it can be found on page 690 of your pew pulp uh, Bible. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appeal over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the darkness, to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on the nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, and the wealth of nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ippa, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Find him as they said. So 
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke's gospel, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Listen again for the word of the Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see... I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the Roman Empire... A uh, census was taken regularly for two reasons, to assess taxes and to find those of age for compulsory military service. The Jews were exempt from military service, so in Palestine, a census would mainly be for taxation purposes. It is a wonderful thing that the story tells us that the first announcement of God came to shepherds. Shepherds were looked down on by orthodox religious people of the day, the polite society. Shepherds, due to the demands of their profession, were unable to keep the details of ceremonial law. They could not observe all of the meticulous hand washings and rules and regulations. Their flocks made constant demands on them, so the good people looked down on them as, as unclean, as less than. 
It was to these simple men of the fields that God's message first came. For most people and families that I know, birth stories are extremely important. I consider myself lucky to have been there for both of my children's births. Me looking at Darcy, really glad I'm not her. My father was not allowed in the room when my brother was born. My brother, James Hawley McKinnon III's birth story is of James Hawley McKinnon Jr. sitting outside the hospital on a step talking to a hospital janitor who was on a smoke break. We chuckle at that memory, but sometimes birth stories are extremely powerful. They can immediately take us to moments where we experienced God's love and presence in a fullness like we have never experienced before as we held our own for the first time. Or it can go the other way to inescapable memories of sadness and struggle. Please know that if that is where your thoughts have gone, we as a congregation honor your memories too. Even when we stand in the presence of trials and pain, we stand on holy ground because God is present with us. Mary certainly had difficult end to her pregnancy. The journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem was 80 miles. The accommodations for travelers were very primitive. Travelers brought their own food. All that the innkeeper provided was a, a place to sleep, a fire to cook on, and food for the animals. The town was crowded, so there was no room for Joseph and Mary inside. And that there was no room in the end is symbolic to what was to happen to Jesus and what continues to happen with many today. When God entered the world and took our flesh and bone, there was no place for him. Ultimately, the only place where there was room for Jesus was on a cross. Jesus came seeking entry into the overcrowded hearts of those around him, and he could not find it. Jesus continues to struggle with overcrowded hearts to this very day. But the birth of Jesus, of course, is different from all births before or since. This is the birth story of all birth stories. Because this is the birth story of the Messiah, the Son of God. The power of the story comes in its humbleness. A babe born in a stable or a cave, wrapped in simple clothes and laid to rest in an animal trough. The birth story is one of simplicity. And the first ones told of the birth of the Messiah the simplest of people, shepherds out in the field. This is who Luke tells us learned of the event before all others. And this is a stunning fact. It parallels a connection to the marginalized, the lowly, and the common and often unacceptable people of first century Judea that will be present throughout Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus always looking to the margins. It reminds us that these are the very people who Jesus will invite to be part of the kingdom of heaven. These are the very people Jesus wants at the banquet of the kingdom of God. What a glimpse into his future life this birth story provides, and what a life he will lead. I think most parents have fears and dreams for their newborns. Many worry about how their children's lives will turn out and if they will be happy. Some are confronted with the child's illness from the onset, while others deal with significant health concerns for their children later in life. Some will be close to their children and some will never learn to relate. Some will face tough teenage and young adult years. And some will watch their children thrive and succeed. Some have had many complications in completing adoption processes. 
And some have tasted the pain of Mary and watched a child suffer and die. I imagine in this story, at this moment, Mary was exhausted but happy. She is concerned but hopeful. And she knows that God has a role in her son's life unlike anything the world has seen or heard before. My friends, this is the second Sunday of Christmas. We should all be happy now, right? Well, yes. But like the birth story, it is more complicated than that this year. This year has been such a mix of wonderful and terrible all wrapped up together, missed once-in-a-lifetime opportunities, and unforeseen once-in-a-lifetime opportunities, all wrapped up together. Perhaps the darkest year in our nation's history, but it ends by the brightness of Bethlehem's star shattering the darkness. Please hear again the words from the prophet. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. I don't know about you, but I am right there with Mary on January 3rd, 2021. I am exhausted, but happy. I am concerned, but hopeful. And I needed to hear Isaiah's words this week to lift me to that place. Christmas, quite frankly, left me just exhausted and concerned. But then I read our Old Testament passage and was reminded of a man who was a hero of mine. I realized that in my fatigue, in my worry, The weight I bear had stooped me over. I was only focusing on the next thing. And even when the next thing is holy or worthy or important, it is just the next thing. It is as if we are walking, stooped over, only seeing what is directly at our feet. We miss so much else. But then the truth beckons us back. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. At times, darkness covers the earth, and we find ourselves thick in darkness. But the Lord has risen upon us. His glory has appeared to us. The brightness of the dawn has already broken into this world. Good Christian friends, lift up your eyes and look around. There is much for us to do that is important for us to keep our eyes focused on God. To the about to be ordained and installed elders and deacons, and to us all, my charge to us today is that we remember the words of Father Antonio Castro, a priest that I met in Nicaragua. You've heard them before, but I think they're worthy of repeating. I asked him why he thought the Christian church struggled so much in the world. He sat quietly for a moment and then said, too many people are looking for God in the wrong place. 
Too many people look to heaven to find God. Instead, they need to lower their gaze until they are looking into the eyes of their neighbors. In the eyes of your neighbor, that is where you will find God. Arise, shine, your light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Hallelujah. Amen. Please rise if you're comfortable uh, and join me as we state the faith of our church as expressed in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Bitter 
perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. Please be seated. When officers in the Presbyterian Church, deacons and elders, are elected to service, uh, the first time they are elected to that office, they are ordained to that position, each either elder or deacon. So you can be ordained twice. Then after that, you are installed to additional terms of service. Uh, this year, we are blessed with both uh, some fresh meat and some new people that will be joining us. So we do have those to be ordained and installed this morning. We have Barbara Charlotte Ford as our uh, new clerk of session uh, to represent the session. And now I would like to invite uh, John Ellis, Seth Keaton, Holly Guadiana, Amanda Ogden, Blaine Moore, Jim Bowman, Paula Denner. Uh, John Harris is joining us uh, via Zoom, so he could be with us today. He clicks all the boxes of danger groups, so he has chosen to stay home, and we are all grateful for that, Mr. Harris, and also Richard Riggs. Hear now these words of Scripture. There are a variety of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in unique ways, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Friends, together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as teaching elders, as ruling elders, and as deacons. Recognizing the importance of each office, the church ordains in order to assure fulfillment of the primary responsibilities of the preaching of the word and administering of the sacraments, ordering the governance of the church, and providing for ministries of care and compassion in the world. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church now ordains John Ellis, Seth Keaton, and Holly Guadiana to the office of deacon and Amanda Ogden to the office of elder and installs them to be active service on their respective boards. The session also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained, Deacon Blaine Moore, and elders Jim Bowman, Paula Denner, John Harris, and Richard Riggs. 
Now I ask you the constitutional questions put forth in the Book of Order. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge Him, Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Universal and God's Word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions. Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world, will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church, do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, will you? For the ruling elders, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? For the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need, and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do we, the members of the church, accept Jim Bowman, Paula Denner, John Ellis, Holly Guadiana, John Harris, Seth Keaton, Blaine Moore, Amanda Ogden, and Richard Riggs as ruling elders or deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? We do. Thank you very much. Uh, due to the pandemic, uh, instead of the traditional laying on of hands, I would invite all uh, ordained elders and deacons in this or any other Presbyterian church to stand where you are uh, and raise your right hand as a sign uh, of laying that hand on our newly ordained and installed. Let us pray. Friends, you are now ruling elders and deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let us pray, gracious God, bless these, your servants. We thank you for the gifts that you have given them and their willingness to use those gifts in your service through this church. Bless our shared ministry together. In Christ's name, amen. Welcome. You may be seated. <laughs> There are, of course, numerous ways where you can, how you can make your tithes and offerings, your contribution to the church. Uh, if you're worshiping with us here in the sanctuary today, you can, of course, place your offering in an envelope and drop it at uh, one of the uh, plates as you leave. Uh, if you're worshiping with us from home, uh, you can either do it through the web, go to Venmo, uh, FPC, OKC, our website, and find the home page. Or you can do it the really old-fashioned way, which works quite well, which is stick your check in an envelope and mail it. Um, 
however you give, um, give as if you made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. pray. Blessed are you, Lord God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made for the sake of whom who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, no. 
Friends, in God's love you were born, in God's mercy you have been held all the days of your life, and as a sign of his everlasting grace, you have been redeemed for a purpose. So I charge you now to go out from this place and continue living in the midst of God's purpose for your life. And as you do, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make the light of his face to shine upon you and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.